The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. to another episode of Speaking with the Senator. I'm Senator Kevin Avard, representing District 12 here in New Hampshire. And today we're going to stay on the topic of energy. And so I invited some folks that have a different perspective of, of our, our energy portfolio. And it has to do with what is called the RPS. And so I invited Jordy Grimless, Bob Olson, and Jason Stock. Hey, we got it right, got ladies it. and gentlemen. I got All the right. names right. Of course, they're written up on the board, so I can, I can tell you that. <laughs> So uh, welcome to the show, everybody. And, and, nice uh, to be here. Good to be here. Energy is such a complicated um, issue. And one of the charges that I had as a senator uh, running the, the committee on, on energy is reducing the cost to ratepayers. And to some degree, we did that, right, Jody? To Right. One thing that's very important um, that a lot of people just don't even aren't even aware of is that the legislature signed by the governor in the state's budget bills from last year um, repealed the electricity consumption tax, which is a tax on every person's bill, residential, commercial, industrial. Um, it's a small amount, but nonetheless, it's an amount that makes a difference every month. Um, that has been repealed. Um, it's perspective. It'll be uh, taken away in January 2019. But it's a tax that is actually going away. Now, where did the money go to from that tax? Did it go to the general fund? Just the um, general, not yeah, infrastructure. It, it, no, it was a tax that went straight into the general fund. Um, I think with the revenues that were coming in, uh, I think it was the Senate kind of took the lead and said, "This is a tax that we can do away with to help reduce um, the electricity uh, rate that uh, price that ratepayers pay." Um, but also, there was the ability to do so in. in in this budget year, so they took the opportunity. Do you remember why it's taking uh, until the next year to, 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 to go into effect? I don't remember all the details, but I think as, as the budget season goes, they tend to look at what's, um, what makes most sense from a planning perspective. And so they want to make sure that while they're balancing the aspects of the budget, because we have New Hampshire has to have a balanced budget, mm -hmm. um, that was part of their consideration when it came to what the revenues were going to be coming into the state. I didn't hear any opposition to that. Uh, there was none. Um, certainly there um, was a lot of support um, because it was, again, a tax being repealed, which is really unheard of um, in, in state government. And quite honestly, it was one that was on your electricity bill. So it would affect every person from the low income customer to the large industrials. Certainly a large industrial customer is going to get much more of a savings sure. just on a percentage basis. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, we, we reduced taxes on a few other things too, but that was uh, that was one of our charges to do, and 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 the Senate got a lot done this 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 last session. Um, Bob, you've sat at my desk and, and kind of schooled me a little bit on on RPS. What does RPS mean? RPS is the acronym for Renewable Portfolio Standard. It's a law that was first passed here in New Hampshire in 2007. And it's a law that provides certain program benefits if one produces energy from renewables as defined in the statute. And that's where Jason comes in, in, in the picture. So a little history. There was one time where we were dependent on a lot of oil, correct? Correct. And that those prices were going skyrocketing at one point. And the legislature came up with the idea, well, we need to expand our portfolio of, of, of energy. And that's partly where it, this came into play? Yes. I mean, if you recall, um, and I'm sure some of your listeners will remember, that in 1973 and 1974, we had oil shocks. People um, would have to wait in line for gasoline. And then there was another oil shock in 1979. 
And the effect of that was that oil prices increased by a factor of four. And New England was, at the time, dependent more than 50% on oil for its electrical generation. So the federal government and the state of New Hampshire each passed separate laws to promote the development of renewable energy and something called cogeneration, which makes use of fossil fuels but in a more efficient manner through reusing the steam cycle. But it promoted for the first time the development of renewable energy. And the New Hampshire law says we want to make sure that our renewables use local fuels, um, that we keep our energy dollars in state instead of buying coal from someplace else or oil from overseas or uranium from wherever we get uranium. Because the problem in New England is we have no natural set of fossil fuels. We don't have gas, we don't have oil, we don't have uranium. What we do have in abundance in New Hampshire is wood. We have um, small hydro stations scattered around the state going back to the mill days in the 1800s. So the RPS, or the Renewable Portfolio Law, comes along and says, I want fuel diversity. I want to have a bunch of different types of fuel so that I'm not dependent on one type of fuel. And that's the problem of putting all your eggs in one fuel basket. So we promote the um, generation of renewable energy as part of the mix. We get all of these benefits, um, including the, the use of wood, which creates jobs, as I'm sure Jason can speak to. And um, we get to keep our fuel dollars in state. Speaking of uh, the wood and, and, and Jason, you, uh, you basically represent the Timber Association. That's correct. And I... Uh, in the study that we had up at the Capitol, you, you, um, you came and testified, and there were some other people that testified on the value of, of the timber industry. One of the big hits that the timber industry had over the past 20 years or whatever was the, was the fact that the mills left, the paper mills left, yep. whether it was paper tech or, or way up north. So the whole industry in our forestry was pretty much um, in the crosshairs of, of, of just collapsing. Yeah, I mean, you know, New Hampshire is, as I've said before, um, New Hampshire is a timber state. You know, we're the second most forested state in the nation. We grow a lot of trees. Um, we're 84% forested. And our trees, we produce lumber. We used to produce a lot more paper. And with the paper mill closures, as we all use, you know, we all go to paperless systems, we've seen a decline in paper consumption. That's caused a, a number of paper mills to close, particularly throughout New Hampshire. The Berlin, Berlin mill was the big, late, latest or last and biggest mill, but also in western Maine. What has, what has occurred is as the industry has evolved, backfilling that, you know, we have all this fiber that used to go into paper making, now goes to make electricity. And for us, as, a, as an industry, it's a really nice fit because we're using a natural resource that's renewable. Um, New Hampshire, we currently grow more trees than we, than we harvest. And so we have this resource here that it's a pretty neat system where we're actually able to take this resource and make electricity out of it. And this keeps growing, keeps coming back. One of the values that, that I took away from, from the study was, was that uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, Go to paper mill, you'll, you'll see a lot of sawdust, you'll see a lot of chips, and you'll see a lot of waste. And that waste has to go somewhere. Uh, we have, a, in our forest, we have some trees that are just, just junk trees, correct? You're, we love them all, but they, there are some <laughs> junk trees out there. Correct. <laughs> and th those have to be, if, they, if they're just left, then, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not really, sh I, I think it would damage our forest and, and actually, when you look at what's happening out west, exactly. in the forest fires, I've been seeing this for a while, though. You know, they, they don't allow a, a good uh, forestry. Or, and we, we have a top notch. No, no pun intended. <laughs> that was good, right? That was very good. No, you know, it, it's, I think New Hampshire in particular has a very pragmatic view of forest and natural resource management. If you have a market, people will manage their woodlot to fill that market need. It used to be paper, it continues to be lumber, and now it's biomass chips, now that we've lost the paper piece. And so, <clears throat> you know, with, if you're not managing your forest, you're going to see um, 
weaker trees, you, you lose your genetics hurt, also the quality of the trees. And like people, as trees get older, their growth slows down. And we want to keep a forest that continues to be vigorous and growing. And, and from a, a wildlife habitat standpoint, you want to have younger forests mixed in with some older forests. You want a diversity of age classes. If you don't have markets, landowners and, and timber landowners, they, they don't have the ability or the opportunity to go out and harvest these trees send them to market, and at the same time create these different habitats and enhance the health of the forest. So when we hear about RPS, we hear uh, from opponents to RPS, we hear, uh, well, you know, this is subsidized. It's subsidized by the, by the rate payers or the bill payers. I don't know however you want to classify that. Um, we see value. We see ripple effects with, with the fact of, you know, well, there's jobs. It involves trucking. There's even fertilizers that's created by a byproduct, which I thought was a great idea. It's cool, uh, which, yep. which cuts down the, the odors in, in, in uh, waste facilities and uh, use it as fertilizer. Uh, but if we do not manage our forests with this industry, not only do the sawmills have to then discard, and they got to pay to bury this stuff or, or ship it out. That's a cost, that will be a cost to the taxpayer somewhere. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then, of course, there's the timber tax, which you sent me something on, which is that, that helps the, the local municipalities. But there are people that will say the, um, the subsidy is, is, is a big part of our bill, like 43 cents on, on, on somebody's bill. And Jody, you, you gave me the uh, understanding that, well, when you look at a piece of a pie, it's, it's a little teeny sliver of the bill. Why is that not a proper argument, if, if, if at all, that uh, we shouldn't continue the RPS? Well, I think when you look at the RPS, you have to go back to the policies of the RPS. And remember, I said we had oil shocks and we were 50% oil. Well, today, we're 50% natural gas. And so in the winter, if we have a cold winter like we had in 2014, the price of electricity increases significantly because natural gas is first used for home heating oil and power plants that we have in New England are mostly natural gas plants. So they have to not run and more expensive facilities come online. So what the renewable portfolio standard gives you is a set of power plants that can run at a constant level of, of revenue essentially. Mm -hmm. And so you're paying for that fuel diversity because you don't want all your eggs in the natural gas basket. The, the other side of the um, of looking at the so-called subsidy question is that um, for the biomass power plants, the wood power plants that use Jason's um, fuel source, we have to um, place a large capital investment into the power plant in order to qualify under the RPS. So it's not a situation where we do nothing and a, a check floats our way. It's a situation where we might invest $5 million in air pollution equipment so that we end up emitting less out of the smokestack than we are allowed to emit under federal and state law. And only if we do that do we then qualify for the RPS. So we provide that fuel diversity and we provide cleaner air than we would have otherwise provided under federal and state law. So the legislature in its wisdom and the feds basically said we want these programs. We're going to encourage you. So somebody will invest $5 million, uh, or, or $10 million, or whatever they need. And, of course, then they're subsidized to some degree on, uh, on, on a bill to, to continue to go. So that, that portfolio continues. From what I understand, some of these operations are, are basically on, on such a small margin that they're actually paying to have their en energy produced. Sure. What's happened today is, and this goes back to what I mentioned a few minutes ago, the energy prices in New England at the wholesale level, not necessarily the retail level, but at the wholesale level are at historic lows. So that if you were to look at um, calendar year 2016 and ask how much did someone get for selling electricity into the wholesale market, you would see that if they sold into what's called the all hours day ahead market, that that price averaged less than three cents a kilowatt hour. And if you look at what it costs to run a biomass plant, 
if you assume that you have fuel at, say, $24 a ton for the biomass chips, and it takes 1.8 tons of biomass chips to produce a megawatt hour, you have a minimum fuel cost of $45 or 4.5 cents. So if you can sell your product for 3 cents, and it costs you 4.5 just to get the fuel, never mind pay the people that work there right. and taxes and the like, you have a, a problem. You need the RPS in order to compensate you to continue to run so you can provide the fuel diversity, the fuel hedge, and um, all the jobs and other economic benefits that come out of the plants. And so I, I, I look at, well, the legislature started this. I, and we're walking, I'm, we're walking into the conversation right now. Yes. And there are some that are advocating to pull the, 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 the rug from underneath those who've invested, who've said, okay, you know what, the state's behind this. We're going to go, you know, we, we trust the state, we trust the feds, they're, they're going to be with us, and we're going to keep this going so that there is that diversity. If something goes down, if, one of the, if the nuclear power plant goes out of business or if the, there's a short demand of, uh, of gas, we'll have this other small portion to help out, you know, in case of emergencies. But if we pull that out, that, that's gone. And then, then there's a, a complete... Well, not a complete monopoly, but there's more dependency on natural fracked gas, or some people are afraid of that. Um, but there are fewer options for us. Right. Correct. One of the you, things, you, Senator, that I think you should just when the RPS passed in 2007, it was bipartisan. Mm -hmm. So it was, I think, it was a unanimous vote in the state senate. Um, it was over 300 votes in the house. So again, looking at the renewable and the industries and the and the businesses that are investing in renewable energy, they did it based on really a bipartisan policy. So it's not a partisan issue, um, you know, like others may be. This was something that was. We need diversity. This creates local jobs, local economic benefit, statewide economic benefit. This is a good policy for the state of New Hampshire. And it's something that, again, a majority, overwhelming majority of, of legislators over the years have continued to support. And, and I, if I can, I think it's important, <coughs> as Jody indicated, to, to focus on the jobs because you can, you can produce power with natural gas, but it means you're really employing people wherever the gas is coming from to produce the fuel. When we do that in New Hampshire with renewable fuels, we're employing loggers and logging companies and New Hampshire trucking companies and keeping the fuel dollars in state. And what that amounts to under a study that, that Jason can speak to, but it was something in excess of $250 million a year in annual economic activity because we have these wood-fired power plants. Mm -hmm. So keeping the dollars in state and creating an economy around these power plants makes a big difference. And so if you pull the rug out from under it, you're pulling the rug out from under a $250 million economic activity that will have ripple effects to sawmills, to um, schools and universities and businesses that use the RPS to reduce their costs. So now, now RPS isn't just wood plants, right? It Correct. It is. It covers solar. It covers wind. It covers small hydro. It covers landfill gas methane, and it also has a component called the thermal component. And thermal is what I meant when I referenced municipalities and hospitals. They will build boilers that will use wood chips to produce steam heat and heat the school building or heat the hospital, or a business might do the same thing in a manufacturing process to provide heat. That's all part of the RPS, and they benefit immensely because they're not using oil or gas to do that. And those wood chips aren't going into landfills and, and filling that up. Right. Yeah, it's great. yeah. I mean, this is, if you think about it, it, it's really kind of an integrated system where you have, you have sawmills that are making lumber. They take a, a round log. They make square lumber. They chip those slabs up. They need a place to go with those chips. Um, you have schools that have a heating need. Those chips go into a school, they go into a power plant, but also in the woods, when that logger comes across that tree that needs to be removed, but it can't, I can't quite get a two by four out of it. Right. Well, let's, let's, let's send it to the power plant, or let's send it to the school. Or the stumps, do they take the stumps too? Generally, no. Really? Um, no, you don't, don't, leave the stump, leave the stump in place, it'll rot. Um, 
or in some cases it'll actually sprout and become a new tree depending on the species. That's another show. Um, but you know, when we, okay. yeah, when we get into the woods and we look at kind of this, you kind of look at it beyond just the power plant. You know, you have the power plant, as I like to say, inside the fence. You may have a couple dozen people working in that power plant. But when we did that study with, with Plymouth State, and then you say, all right, well, who's providing wood to that plant? You've got loggers and truckers. You have landowners. You have sawmills. It's, Bob's right. It's $254 million a year in economic activity that's, that's every year churning through our, our economies and our rural communities and urban communities. Um, it's a lot sit, of taken out of Mason, from what I understand. Yeah, Mason. Um, Manchester has, has a really, um, really good uh, forestry program on their waterworks property. They do a lot of biomass harvesting there in the city of Manchester and in Hooksett. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so you, you have over 900 jobs just in the woods, just in the power plants. That doesn't, you know, and then you've got, you know, then let's look at the next ring out. Um, you've got all the support industries, all the support businesses. So this, and, you know, the RPS is kind of the, the hub in this that keeps this thing going. And that's why when, when issues come up and why we're such a strong proponent of, you know, keeping the RPS and, as you said, not wanting to pull the rug out, that's why we're so adamant about it. Because this affects not just a couple people inside the fence. It goes well out into our communities, hits our select boards, hits our, hits our schools. And, of course, there's the timber tax. Which is a and, of, and of course, there's always the timber tax. <laughs> timber in the state of New Hampshire is considered real property, and when you cut that property, the ten percent goes to the town. And if I don't have a place to sell it to a power plant or to that school or you know for their or the greenhouse that's using it for their boiler, I don't get. I don't. The landowner doesn't get paid. The town doesn't get their tax. Another topic on, with related to this, and now we did a study on transmission, distribution, and generation. And of course, we did a study on the RPS. They are integrated to, to some degree. They, they relate to each other. What I understand is that the state of New Hampshire has a responsibility to the grid of paying a certain portion of the transmission cost. Is that correct? Sure. For certain projects that um, the grid, and the grid is managed by a federally created entity called ISO New England or ISO New England. And if a project is a reliability project, then those costs are shared among the six New England states. And New Hampshire pays its pro rata share of that, which is something a little more than 9%. The reason I brought this up, it is my understanding that we pay about 9, 4, 9, 5, 9, 7 percent of that, that grid. Now, uh, other states like Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Vermont are taking advantage of uh, you know, uh, energy efficiency. We had Don Grease on here. Uh, and they're also um, taking advantage of, of renewables, obviously. That is cutting their, their need for transmission. Okay. Am I right so far? Well, I, I think so. I mean, I'm not that not familiar. Distribution. Right, not distribution. I'm not that familiar with how much of an inroad into transmission that their activities produce. But I can tell you, certainly, Massachusetts has been very, very aggressive on promoting solar. Um, and so you have solar connected at, at their um, distribution levels. And in theory, if you deliver that solar during the peak hours, then you're flattening the peak of electricity demand. And that can have an effect in the transmission price you pay. And what I learned, hello, was that transmission and distribution are two different things. Transmissions are the, the big power lines. The distribution are the, where, where it just gets, gets into the, to the system. How does RPS fit into this? And, and, and where am I going with this question? If we lose this industry, then we have more dependency on the transmission, from what I understand, raising our need and our cost. And so if we lose this end, we're going to need more transmission. Well, I think with respect to transmission, um, it's, it's regulated at the federal level, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, sometimes called FERC, mm -hmm. um, regulates the, the transmission system. The distribution system is regulated by the New Hampshire Public Utilities Commission. The difference is when you look at lines, they have a kilovolt rating 
or a KV rating. So any line in New Hampshire that is rated 115 kilovolts and above is considered transmission. The lines out on your street are either 13.8 or 35 and a half. That's distribution. And power flows through substations to get to these various points so you can use it. And then we have some very high voltage lines that, for example, might come out of Seabrook Station, 345 kilovolts, or lines that come out of Canada to deliver hydropower that might be 450 uh, kV uh, direct current lines. So you have all these lines and they're all subject to different regulations and different cost structures. And as you develop power needs, um, you're going to be pulling power through those lines. And if you end up not having power plants in state and you end up having purchased power, then you need more lines to carry that purchase power. And depending on whose jurisdiction that line might be, you might see rate effects from that. So FERC has a um, transmission rate and a transmission rate of return that I believe is a little higher than the one given in New Hampshire. And so those rates of return can affect your electric bills. Right. So if we got rid of RPS, it, it, our rate, it doesn't mean your rates are going to go down, basically. It, no, if, if I don't. There's a higher potential of it going up. I think if you were to get rid of RPS completely, you would see a negligible effect on your electric bill because I think as um, you said or maybe Jody said earlier in this program, it's about 1% on the bill. So you have to, have to ask the question, what drives the rest of the 99% on the bill? Right. And I know your um, Senate Bill 125 study committee that you chair, you've heard testimony uh, from the Public Utilities Commission where I believe the numbers are something like don't hold me to the exact numbers, but something like transmission rates have gone up 450% over the last seven years. I think you're being kind. I think it was 555%. Okay. So somewhere in, that order, somewhere in that order of magnitude, right. you can see that. And there's more on coming. the way. Yes. Yeah. And, and so the reason I brought up the transmission is because our, our, our responsibility for the transmission statewide is about 9 percent or half, 9.5 9 percent. On those reliability problems. And those could increase if we do not take advantage of energy efficiency and uh, in, in RPS, from yes. what I understand. That's why I, even though they're two separate issues, they're still related in, in to your bill. And 43 percent, 43 cents on, on a bill is basically your RPS. Whatever. Yeah, I don't recall the exact uh, number. 1%. It's, it's let's the 1%. Stick, let's stick with 1%. Uh, whereas the other 99%, whereas don't be complaining about the little 1% when there's 99% exactly. that we really have to, to consider. So I see we're running out of time. So um, how can people learn more about RPS? Um, well, they can come to your Senate hearings on uh, <laughs> Senate Bill 51, <laughs> which are just about done. But um, they can certainly contact us or... Um, I think there's always activity in the legislature, but the PUC webpage has a um, section called the Sustainability Division. And if you were to go to the Sustainability Division section of the Public Utilities webpage, there's all the information you would ever want to know about RPS. And they do and reports. Thank you all for coming on the show. And as I can say, we're running out of time, so uh, I just I appreciate you coming on. It's a complicated issue. We're going to have people talking about the other aspects of energy. But we hope this helps you understand the conversation we're hearing at, at the Capitol, and there's more to come. There's uh, transmission, there's uh, uh, distribution, there's, there's generation, and there's a whole bunch of ideas out there. So uh, just to give you an understanding of what's going on, uh, hopefully this is helping. So until next week, thanks for watching, speaking with the Senator. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.